here is the guide to the respiratory tracing calculations for laboratory 2526. You can find this at the end of the respiratory discussion uh, for the PowerPoints. This is the lab 2526 discussion number two, because we did the first half already for the biopack lesson eight and the spirometry. Um, there's also a PDF file on line in the answer section to it's probably the very last one of the very last files uh, for the semester. Uh, if you go all the way, 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 way down the modules, there's a PDF file, many pages that explains it um, as well. So uh, this video will hopefully do a good job where that will just be something you need to supplement with. So we're going to look at the respiratory tracings and see how we can measure different things. So first of all, I want you to find, uh, you know, a little bit of time to look at what a respirometer is. And uh, this is the same model almost that we have in the laboratory. It's a little different. This is a little newer. Um, notice it's got a clear uh, bell. Uh, ours is a uh, steel one. Um, but what I want to kind of show you is, is a couple different things. Um, number one, uh, we have these tubes that lead to a mouthpiece. Okay? So this mouthpiece is where it looks like a snorkel that you'd breathe through. Right? You'd wear a nose clip. Right? The valve has little things you can turn so that you can uh, have the person breathe room air or into the bell. Uh, you've got these tubes. One of the tubes goes into the CO2 absorbent canister. So this canister uh, has something called soda lime. Okay? So sometimes called barrel lime. But the soda lime crystals, their job is to remove CO2 from the air. Okay? So that's the job of these soda lime crystals. They don't have to be there unless you're breathing for an extended period of time. But we're measuring respiratory variables. And one of the things we saw back in lab two, two way back, literally the one of the first experiments for this semester, uh, was that if we hyperventilated, we changed the amount of CO2 in our body, which then affected our ventilation. So the amount of CO2 plays a role in determining your ventilation. If we're trying to measure your ventilation on a laboratory equipment, a medical device, then we should not have changed it based on the test that we're doing. So we need to remove the CO2. So what happens um, is this bell goes up and down and that writes on the chymograph drum. Okay, and then we can record what we're seeing and then be able to analyze it. Um, this has a thermometer here that we're measuring temperature. Uh, we have to remember this temperature to figure out something called BTPS. So this is going to tell us the temperature we need because as air moves from a temperature of probably 70 degrees or so in a laboratory, right, and goes into your lungs, as we saw in the lesson eight experiment from the biopack, that the temperature of that gas changes. And as the temperature changes, if the temperature increases, everything else being equal, the volume of gas goes up. And if the temperature decreases, the volume of gas goes down. So we have to account for that. And so if you're doing this test in a cold room versus a warm room, we need to standardize that. So we use this BTPS correction factor. The uh, BT is body temperature. The P is pressure. Uh, we do not have a uh, basically a humidity gauge here, but we would have to measure the relative humidity um, uh, and the barometric pressure. So uh, the barometric pressure you'd measure with the barometer. You can get that online pretty much anywhere nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of local weather stations. If you look hard enough, you can find out what the barometric pressure is in the area you're at. Um, and again, we just want to standardize everything to, to one atmospheric pressure, which is 760 millimeters of mercury. And 
that's the the pressure and then the s is saturated when we breathe out air it is typically saturated with oxygen and sorry oxygen water vapor that water vapor takes space up and increases or changes the volume of the gas that we have so we have to standardize all that and make it equal with this BTPS correction factor. Uh, there's a nice long equation once you know the factors that you can use and figure it out. I don't think I've ever calculated it in a laboratory setting where it wasn't at least 1.05 and was never above 1.025. Sorry, 1.0125. So basically, it's pretty close almost always to like 0.08 to 0.10. So we're just going to assume it's 1.1. So our BTPS correction factor, we're going to assume for the purpose of the laboratory calculations, it's 1.1. And if we had calculated it in the lab one day, it would probably be really close to 1.1. So it's a good assumption there. So that's how the respirometer works. Um, the other side of the coin uh, is once you hook the person up and they're breathing on the valve, right, into the bell, then the only air that the person is breathing is the air that started in the bell, the air that was in all the tubes in the canister, and the air that was in their basically respiratory system. So over time, what's going to happen is this volume of gas is going to go down it goes down basically for two reasons reason number one is when we fill this with room air it starts with 21 percent oxygen almost the oxygen percentage in the room air is 20.93 percent so a little under 21 percent so as the person breathes they've got plenty of oxygen to start with and uh, their body's going to be able to use it and keep metabolism going aerobically and things like that which is great However, as they use that oxygen up, the oxygen content is going to go down. So that decreases the volume. Now, normally in humans, we replace that with CO2. And in this case, for our subject, they do. Except, remember, we have the CO2 absorbent, those barrel lime or soda lime crystals down here. And that's going to remove the CO2. So as the CO2 gets removed, that's going to drop the bell. Okay, And that's going to decrease the volume of our respirometer. So um, that is a normal occurrence. It's not leaking, probably. It's because the CO2 is being removed, and that decreases the volume. So one of the things that I want to call your attention to uh, for our tracing is that uh, this is a newer design here for the respirometer. Uh, our our respirometer is an older respirometer and basically we have this pulley system and the pen it doesn't really show it very well here is part of this pulley system and so when the person breathes in the bell goes down because they breathe in air and because this is on a pulley the pen actually goes up so when they inhale the pen goes up so one of the things that you have to make a note of and I'd, I'd write this down Right, is that the up direction, anything going up, that's inspiration. And anything going down, that's expiration. So as an example, if we were going to measure something called um, inspiratory reserve volume, inspiratory, right, then you would have to go in the up direction because that's inspiration. So uh, volume, let's kind of look over here, goes up and down. Okay, so volume goes up and down, and time, you'd expect probably, goes across, right? And then sometimes knowing the time is very useful, so we can figure out respiratory rate as an example, um, or, you know, other things, you know, what a minute is or 30 seconds. Um, so we can measure time and volume on this. And uh, basically the paper wraps around the chymograph drum, and when you're done, you can just peel the paper off and, Put it flat and be able to analyze it so here's a typical tracing that somebody might do it's not really exactly typical because it would be hard to do this first thing but this is inspiration up and expiration down you can kind of see that up and down and they take in a big breath 
And then they go back to normal breathing, right? So you wouldn't be able to do that probably in real life. And then they take as much air as they can in and they blow as much air as they can out. And then they go back to normal breathing. So based on that breathing pattern, we can measure the inspiratory reserve volume, your inspiratory capacity, your vital capacity, like we did in lab with the spirometer. Um, we can measure your expiratory reserve volume. We can measure your tidal volume back and forth here. We can't measure the residual lung volume or anything that includes that. So this bottom green part, we can't directly measure the residual lung volume the way we did it. There's actually a couple ways you could do it. We're not going to worry about it. Um, but, you know, when they do that, oftentimes they estimate it based on portion of your vital capacity as an example. Um, and then uh, we can't measure FRC, functional residual capacity, or total lung capacity either because you need the residual lung volume to do that. Um, the residual volume, uh, even though we can't measure, is an interesting physiological thing because it's the air left in the lungs after you expire. So just like we talked about when the uh, heart would beat, it wouldn't spit out all the blood in the ventricle, it would leave some. Uh, well, the same thing is true of our respiratory system. So if you expired all the air you could get out, you'd still have air left in your lungs. And there's two reasons for that physiologically. Um, the first one is obvious if you think about it. Uh, we need oxygen and CO2 to, to be exchanged continuously. We just don't want to get oxygen when we inhale and then CO2 out when we exhale. We want that always exchanging. And so if your lung, lungs completely collapsed and didn't have any air in it, then you wouldn't have any exchange. Uh, the other reason um, is more of a physical type reason. And it's sort of like uh, blowing up a balloon. Uh, even though you're not supposed to give balloons to kids anymore uh, to play with, uh, a lot of times when kids want to blow up a balloon, uh, it, they need an adult or somebody with bigger lungs to start it. And that's because the balloon is harder to blow when the balloon is smaller than it is bigger. And the same thing is true of your lungs. If your lungs don't have a lot of air in it, it could be potentially more difficult to put air into it. And if they stay partially inflated, that, that helps. Uh, we also have a, a chemical that's produced in the body called surfactant that helps equalizes that pressure so it's not as big a deal. But really, it's the continuous exchange that's the, the main point of that. So that's kind of the, the respiratory tracing, and we should be able to measure many of those variables. Um, a couple general notes and rules, and we'll kind of look at a, a, the tracing in a minute. Um, the recording paper is typically divided into one millimeter squares. The one we use in lab is one millimeter squares. So that's going to become important. Uh, we can calculate volumes or capacities if we want, and we measure up and down on the page. So you go up and down. Right? And in order to, to do that, and you measure the squares, we don't breathe 32 squares or whatever. We breathe a certain volume. So you need what's called the bell correction factor. And that bell correction factor, it just depends on the size of the bell. Uh, for the one we have in the laboratory that the respiratory tracing we're going to analyze is from, has a bell correction factor of 30 mLs per one millimeter. So every change in one millimeter height volume, that's a change in 30 mLs for the bell. So every one box up or down is 30 mLs. And so all volume calculations have to use that factor. You have to figure out the bell correction factor. Uh, as I mentioned before, we also need the BTPS correction factor. And we're just going to assume it's 1.1. And that's, again, the body temperature, pressure, and uh, saturated. That's what the S stands for. Um, and that's the saturation of your gas with water. So here's a general formula that you want to remember. Uh, any volume or capacity is the number of boxes in millimeters times the Bell correction factor times the BTPS correction factor. 
since we already know those values, we're going to have them constant. We can say any volume or capacity we want to measure is the number of boxes times 30, because that's the bell correction factor, times 1.1. Okay. And if you look at the units, <clears throat> the BTPS correction factor is unitless, so that doesn't matter. The number of boxes that we measure that in millimeters, and the bell correction factor is how many mils per millimeter. So the millimeters cancel out, and we're left with mLs. And technically, for most of the things, it's mLs per breath, although nobody ever says that. Um, one of the points that students have, and kind of difficult to do sometimes, is measuring the speed. Okay, And the chymograph speed is given. There's a little set of buttons on the front of the respirometer that we can push to make the chymograph drum move at different rates. And so as we move at different rates, that gives us the ability to, sort of like we've seen in Biopack, to bunch the data together or to spread it out so it's easier to measure, right? So as an example, there's something on our tracing that we're going to measure something called FEV1s, forced expiratory volume. The one actually stands for one second. So in that case, somebody would breathe in as much air as they could and then breathe out as much air as hard and as fast as they could. And so we want to be able to move the drum fast enough so we can measure second by second changes in respiration. Um, and so we need to be able to do that. Uh, we can get that from the what's called the paper speed. And so as an example, if the paper speed was 50 millimeters per minute, that means that we'd have to calculate 50 millimeters, 50 boxes across, and that would equal one minute. So as an example, I don't want a minute maybe, maybe I only want 30 seconds. So if I have half a minute, I need half of 50 millimeters, so I would need 25 millimeters, okay? Now, you could have, and they're actually, you know, usually on, depends on the, the quality of the respirometer, but most respirometers have somewhere between three and five speeds that they go. Uh, and some of those are standard respiratory uh, speeds for, for certain tests. But, you know, let's say to make it easier, if the paper speed was 500 millimeters per minute, okay, so that would be a lot faster because it's moving 500 millimeters per minute. And then you had 50 millimeters again. In this case, it would be a tenth of a minute because we're a tenth of 500. While in the first case, when the paper speed was 50 millimeters per minute, it represented a whole minute. All right. Um, one of the things also to remember as you calculate things is that your values could be slightly different than the key that I've posted because when you count and I count and actually the um, tracings themselves, uh, most of those I went over in an actual sharp, a fine tip Sharpie. So in many cases, the actual tracing is at least a millimeter meter thick. So depending on how you count, and those boxes are sometimes difficult to count, especially if you're doing a lot, you know, you can be off by a box or two really easily. So, you know, if, if you're measuring something and I got 18 and you got 19, that's fine. But if I got 18 and you got 57, then one of us is wrong. And, uh, you know, you need to figure out who. Uh, and if it's me, let me know. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, Make sure you're counting the right thing, but don't expect it to be exactly the same every time. Uh, because, uh, you know, when we do this in class, uh, we usually have students, you know, analyze stuff as we go along. And I see, you know, sometimes for one of the tracings, as an example, um, probably half the class gets 18. And we also get people to get 17 and 16. And we also get some people to get, say, say 19. So, you know, those boxes are tough, difficult to count and, you know, expect to be a little bit different, but not too different. So a box or two is okay. If you're seven or boxes off, then that's probably something you're not counting right correctly. So uh, what I did is uh, I have a respiratory tracing 
guide that I, I've done from a set of respiratory variables that we measured uh, one day on, on one subject. And I spent a lot of time getting that data uh, from that person. Uh, so now I just use it because of the difficulty and impossibility of being able to disinfect the equipment in between different subjects. Uh, not all labs would be able to do it, so it's not fair that anybody really does it in some ways. Um, so uh, I'm going to go back and forth between between these two things here to kind of show you what I mean. So a recording paper is divided into one millimeter section. So if I go to the next one, you can see the millimeters, right? So these little tiny boxes, those are millimeters, right? Now this may uh, not show up exactly the way it should here because of magnification issues, but if you actually had this printout, right, then uh, they'd be pretty close to millimeter. Now, if you look, there's a couple other things you can see, right? So to make the counting easy, you can see these larger boxes. So see these little thicker outlines of these? Those are 10 by 10. And subtly in the 10 by 10, you can see it's like a little plus. So those are five by five. So it makes it pretty easy to count. As an example, one of the things we'd want to count is this measurement here. And it goes all the way down here, right? And actually it starts up here. So it goes up here, that's the maximum inspiration, and then it goes all the way down to right there, that's maximum expiration. And you've got to count those number of boxes. And it's like 130 or so. So you don't want to go one, two, three, four, like that. But if you start here, right, here's the easiest way to count, um, is using these thicker lines. So this goes a little below, what do you say, two millimeters below that thicker line here. And then I just go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 10, 20. That's about eight there. Remember, we had two extra here. It's about 130 from from peak to peak. So that's a vital capacity, actually. And then uh, we'd have to do those other things we talked about to, to get it to an actual number that made sense. But it makes it a lot easier if you understand that to count things. Okay. Um, so uh, we have this tracing that we're going to use sort of as our, as our, as our tracing here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over, you know, some of the more important uh, variables. So for each tracing, there's a box right above it or in this case, a set of tracings. Um, we have paper speed. We need to know that. We have the Bell correction factor. That's the one, mil equals, one millimeter equals 30 mils, All right? Um, and then we have tidal volume, respiratory rate, minute ventilation, oxygen consumption we want to measure for, for this set. And then we've got one here. And then if you look at the, the sheet, there's a backside that also has the information on it that will tell you what we need for the, for the last one. So instead of just looking at this the way it is, um, I made it a little bit easier and I blew it up. Okay. So this, this one right here, we blew up to right here. Okay. So let's go back here though and, and look at this again. Um, so to calculate the volumes, we need to move up and down the page. So that's up and down, right? Um, and uh, because the bell is hooked up, as I said, to the pulley, it's going to be backwards. So inspiration is up and expiration is down. Uh, all volumes need to be adjusted to BTPS. We're going to assume it's 1.1. Uh, all volumes need to be adjusted to the bell correction factor. That's the top. We're going to, that's for our uh respirometer it's 30 mils equals one millimeter all right time moves across the page so we're going to have to note the paper speed all right and again just that note that you might be different than me in terms of your calculations so we have all that information that we need here uh, to measure so let's go ahead and measure and look at what we need to know for this first tracing this top tracing right here Notice it's pretty simple. It's just a series of breaths that go across the page. Uh, there's a couple things to note about it, though. Not everyone's exactly even. Some are closer together and some are further apart. So uh, we're not machines. We don't breathe the exact same amount or the exact same speed every time. 
And again, notice that the slope is going up. So uh, this is the earlier time. Times are going across. This is a later time. So the slope is going up. And I've explained that already. The reason why this slope is going up is because our body is using the oxygen out of the bell and replacing it with CO2. Since the bell also has the CO2 absorbent on it, those soda lime crystals, it's removing the CO2 and it's making the bell actually lose volume. But because the bell volumes are inversely proportional to what we expect, as the volume goes down, the bell gets, not the bell, the uh, pen writes higher. So that's representative of a, a lower volume. So as this goes up, that means the volume, this, this slanted slope here, right? That means the volume of the bell is actually going down, which is what we expect, okay? So here's our first tracing. I blew it up, make it easier to see. You can probably, you know, much easier count these little squares now. Um, what's given from that box, I moved down onto here. So it says the paper speed is 50 millimeters per minute. That's going to be important in a second. The bell correction factor, as always for our, ours, is 30 mils per one millimeter. That's not going to change. And the BTPS correction factor, we're going to assume is 1.1 because it's probably really close. A couple formulas we might want to need for this because this is what we need to know down here. Tidal volume respiratory rate, something called minute ventilation and oxygen consumption. So, in order to measure uh, tidal volume um, and oxygen consumption, that V actually stands for volume as well, um, we need the formula. We need to count the number of boxes in millimeters, multiply it by the bell correction factor. That's up here. Multiply it by 1.1. That's the BTPS correction factor. That's right here. And get the answer. And for minute ventilation, it's pretty easy. Once we know tidal volume respiratory rate, minute ventilation is basically how much air you expire out of your lungs in a given amount of time, typically per minute. So the V, again, stands for volume. The capital E is expired. So this is actually somewhat analogous to cardiac output. Cardiac output is how much blood your heart can spit out in a minute. Minute ventilation is how much air your lungs can spit out in a minute. And again, it's out. It's capital E. If I had said V with a capital I, that's inspired. It's a slightly different volume than VE uh, for various reasons, some of which I've touched on um, in terms of especially you know temperature changes, humidity changes. Um, and uh, changes in, in gas composition. So to get min ventilation, then it's just tidal volume. We're going to measure that. Times respiratory rate. We're going to measure that. We just have to put that in your calculator and punch it out. And the oxygen consumption is one that's kind of a little more difficult to, to understand how to do. So again, here's all the important information that we have for figure 1A. And let's go ahead and figure it out. So before we do that, let's kind of look here and, and kind of see what's going on. So what I've done is I've drawn in the lines of best fit for you. So here's a line of best fit that tries to take into account. It's just eyeballed. It's not calculated. The average end of one of these uh, ends. Now remember, right, um, inspiration is up, expiration is down. So it's the bottom of these. So notice there's a few that go past the line and there are a few that's above the line and that takes the average into account. Top does the same thing. That line of best fit is, is drawn in. So basically, from line to line, that's our average tidal volume. So theoretically, if you drew these correctly, these would be parallel and it wouldn't matter where you counted. Okay, exactly looks like to me, and if I went and counted, it's probably a little more narrow here than it is here. So I try to find some convenient spot that I can I can easily calculate and I can see what I want to see. Um, so uh, sometimes the very edge is good. Like this is a pretty easy place to do it. And again, I'd say these parallel. Um, so I can I can count pretty 
pretty confidently here. So I'm just going to count up this black line right here from the bottom to the top. So I'm going to start a little below this line. Okay. Now I want to say one, two, three to get to that big line here. Okay. And then there's five and there's 10. So there's 10 in between. So that 3 to here plus 5 is 8 plus this is 13, another 5. And then there's plus what? 1, 2, 3, 4, maybe 5. So let's call it 18. I call it 18. So if that's 18 millimeters, you could count 17, you could count 16, you could probably count 19. But if I said that's 18 millimeters, you go here and go, okay, how many small boxes? Right? I like to do. I'm going to start right here because it crosses the line exactly. There's 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, or 18. So 17 or 18 there. So that makes my thought that I did it right. So we'll come over to the figure and say, okay, here from this line in pink all the way up to this line in pink, right? That's 18 millimeters. Oh, there we go. That's 18 millimeters, right? And so that's my tidal volume. But that doesn't make any sense to us because we don't measure this in millimeters. We need it in mLs. So to get to that, right, we're going to take 18 millimeters times our bell correction, 30 mils per millimeter. So that's 540 times 1.1. So that's just going to add 10 more percent. So it's going to add another 54. So 540 and 54 is 594 mils per breath. So that's my tidal volume. Okay. If you counted 17, right, the only difference would be this is 17. So 17 times 30 is 510 times 1.1 would be 561 mils per breath. So again, anything within about well, usually one or two millimeters uh, plus or minus is fine. So that's how we would measure uh, on this the tidal volume. Okay, so pretty simple. We also want to measure the respiratory rate. Now, the respiratory rate is how many breaths do you have in a given amount of time? And almost always, just like heart rate, it's per minute. Okay, so. What I do is I look at the paper speed and I say, okay, I got 50 millimeters per minute. In a perfect world, it would be great to have 50 millimeters of data at least, because then I could count 50 milliliters of data, sorry, 50 millimeters of data. And when I counted 50 millimeters of data, I know since the paper speed is 50 millimeters per minute, that's one minute. So if I start up here, and I could have made this, should have made this dot at the big line. So right here, here's my starting dot, okay? I'm going to count over and see if I got 50 millimeters. So there's 10, 20 to this one, 30 to this one, 40 to this one. Remember, big ones are 10, 50 here. So I've got just a little over 50 millimeters. That's all I need, all right? So since I know this is a minute, now all I need to do is count the breaths. Now technically, you're supposed to count, because since we're going to measure eventually minute ventilation expired, the VE, you should count the expirations. Okay? So remember, inspiration is up, expiration is down, so you should really count the little troughs here. However, it really doesn't matter, and you could shift your count over a little bit, if you had, a, especially if you had a longer uh, tracing um, and invariably if someone breathes in they eventually gonna breathe out or they're gonna die and you won't have to worry about measuring stuff on them right so the uh, uh, minute uh, sorry the, the respiratory rate works best by just deciding I'm gonna always count the peaks or I'm always count the valleys I would learn when I was in school to count the valley valley so I do but I know most students prefer to count the peaks and it doesn't matter Right, so I'm just going to go from this line right here, right a little below this, this dot, to this line over here because that's 50 millimeters. 
And so if you decide, I'm just going to count the peaks, you go, okay, look, this peak is outside of that, so I wouldn't count that. But this one is there, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay? If you count the valleys, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So you get 13 or 14. If you want to count this one, that would be 14. It's up to you. Okay. Um, if you started counting uh, two millimeters before this line, then you'd stop two millimeters before this line. You'd get 14. You started after, you get 13. Again, if you're off by one, plus or minus, you're, you're fine. So this case is pretty easy. I counted... 13 breaths or 14 breaths, let's say 14 breaths, in that 50 millimeters. Since I know that 50 millimeters is 50 millimeters per minute, I know my respiratory rate, this one's easy, is 14 breaths per minute. All right. If you don't have an exact minute, then you need to try to find some convenient number that's a portion of that. Right. So if I don't have a minute, uh, you can count for 30 seconds. So if it's 50 millimeters per minute and you had at least 25 millimeters worth of data, you could do that. Okay. You could count it for 20 seconds and multiply it by three. You can count it for, you know, 30 seconds and multiply it by two. You can't go much lower than 20 seconds though, because as the respiration uh, is so slow, it's hard to get an accurate count once you get up below 20 seconds. And if you had a two-minute tracing, uh, it's a lot easier than you think. You wouldn't count the two minutes and then divide by two. You just pick a random minute and count it, and you're done. So, uh, you know, the way it, it's done then is here we started at this thick line, right? And we ended at that thick line. So you can see the 50 millimeters here. The paper speed was given as 50 millimeters per minute. Here we counted the breaths, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 14. Okay, so all the way to 14, we counted the breaths. So that's a minute worth of time. So we get 14 breaths in one minute. So my respiration rate is 14 breaths per minute. Okay, so once we know that, we now have enough data to calculate the minute ventilation. The minute ventilation, again, is known as VE the volume of your expired gas, and it's pretty easy to measure, okay? It's tidal volume times respiratory rate. So let's look at the units first. We got mils per breath for tidal volume. We got breaths per minute for respiratory rate. So if the breaths cancel out, we get mils per minute. That'll be our units. And since we know our tidal volume was 594 mils per breath. We know our respiratory rate was 14, because we just counted them up here. And we get 594 times 14 equals 8,316 mils per minute. Okay. So that one's pretty easy. It's just like cardiac output, but it's for the lungs instead of the heart. All right now, the, the VO2 is the one that kind of throws students off. This is one of the more difficult ones to measure. And in order to measure it, you again have to understand how it works. Okay. What we're going to measure is basically the slope of the line. And remember, the slope of the line is dictated by how much gas is removed from our system, our body, the bell, the hoses, and everything combined. And again, even though we have these normal respiratory up and down movements, right, we see that the bell is going down and losing volume because our tracing is over time going up, which is reflective of the bell losing volume. So it's natural. It should happen. We want it to happen. We don't want the CO2 to build up. Uh, we don't want to run out of oxygen. I've seen that happen before when somebody stayed on too long and fainted. I've seen people that uh, had CO2 absorbent crystals that were uh, 
uh, used up, so they lost their ability to absorb the CO2, and I've seen people faint because of that as well. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, uh, it, it doesn't happen uh, too often. And if you pay attention and take care of your equipment, it shouldn't happen at all. So when we measure the oxygen consumption, we're going to use the slope of that line to figure out what it is. And here's one of our assumptions in order to be able to do this. Our assumption is that we're going to use some of the oxygen in our normal metabolic processes, and we're going to re be removing that from the system. When we use oxygen, we're going to replace that with CO2. We're going to assume a one-to-one -one ratio. That's not a great assumption at rest. You actually make a little more uh, of one than the other at rest. And at exercise, you make more CO2 than you make than you use oxygen. And at rest, you make you use more oxygen than you make CO2. But it depends on a couple other things in your body. And really, you know, assuming it's a one-to-one -one ratio is not so bad. So if you assume it's a one-to-one -one ratio, that means for every molecule of oxygen that you used in metabolism, you made a molecule of CO2. And every molecule of CO2 that we make, I guess because that we produce, right, that gets removed by the crystals, and that makes us lose the volume of the bell. So we can use the drop in the volume of the bell to figure out how much CO2 is removed and making the assumption that the CO2 and the oxygen are a one-to-one -one ratio, we can therefore say, oh, our oxygen is the same. So to measure VO2, we need our time factor again. We've already counted a minute. So if you start again right at this thick line here and go all the way to the thick line at the end, that's 50 millimeters. That's exactly one minute. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a triangle. And this one really actually kind of works out very nicely. So right where it crosses this line, I'm going to start. I'm going to draw a line across the bottom right there. And then I'm going to go from this and count up to where I run into the bottom of the tracing. Because that's how much the bell dropped. Okay. So I've already measured this as 50 millimeters across. So that means it's one minute. And if I start here, the bell dropped 5, 10, 15, 16, 17. I'm going to say the bell dropped 17 millimeters in one minute. So once I know my millimeters, then I can multiply by my bell correction and then my BTPS. Although as an aside, for those of you who get into clinical medicine, especially in exercise physiology. We typically don't measure oxygen consumption in the units of BTPS. We measure it in units of what's called STPD, which stands for standard temperature pressure dry. So it's a little different uh, variable. Same idea, though, trying to standardize our, our, our values. Uh, but uh, we're going to put all this just to be consistent in BTPS. So if you come over here, um, you'll look, and this is the drawing I did. So I drew in black across the bottom, right? And then said, okay, this is how much the bell has dropped over time, this green line here. And I counted that as 17 millimeters. That's our VO2. Um, because we counted from this line to that line, and that's 50 millimeters, it means we moved 17 millimeters, dropped 17 millimeters in one minute. So once we do that, now I can say, okay, 17 millimeters times my bell correction, 30 mLs per millimeter, times 1.1 1 .1 is 561. Okay. Now since my paper speed is 50 mLs per minute, it's still um, one minute. So that means my oxygen consumption is 561 mLs per minute. Now, let's say the paper speed was 100 for this example. So instead of having 50 up here where it says paper speed, let's say it was 100. All right. Now, we can't do any more in terms of counting here. We're still limited by the size of our paper, which is a little over, what, 55 millimeters. So I can't count 100 millimeters in my tracing because I just don't have the data. So what I would do...
is I would do the same thing and I would count out 50 millimeters, which is a nice increment of 100. It's half, right? And I would um, see what this slope was and it would still be 17, okay? But in this case, I'd say, okay, the belt drops 17 millimeters in 30 seconds. Okay, why 30 seconds? Well, if it's the paper speed was 100 millimeters per minute and we only went 50, that means that uh, we only went 30 seconds. So if we counted 17 drop in 30 seconds, that means if we equated that to a minute, we'd have to multiply it by 2, and that would be 34 millimeter drop in a whole minute. So you have to make those adjustments and figure out what it is, uh, but this is how we figure out the, the VO2. Alright, so this goes through what we just did. So you can see that and how to get the respiratory rate. So this, I'm not going to go over it here, but you can read it. It goes over how to get all that, how to get the VO2 and why and things like that. So I'm not going to do this on the video, but notice the tracing below it. Okay, so go way back here. This is my top tracing. This is the bottom tracing. So that's the second one. And that set and that second one what we had done that day is we had the person go out and exercise and then they came back and they were breathing hard and then we hooked them up and measured the same things we tried to measure before um, here and so there's a couple things to notice all right one the respirations are larger so they have a larger tidal volume okay right? two note they're closer together so we have a higher respiratory rate. Three, note the slope of the line is much steeper. And those would all be indicative of the person exercising. But even though we have all that data from exercise, we do the exact same thing we did before. So if I want to count tidal volume, right, I'll do it up here, up here again because it's a pretty easy spot. So I'm going to start right here from this line of best fit, literally right at this line. I'm going to go up this line and go, there's 10, there's 20, there's 30, I'm going to say 34. So the tidal volume is 34 millimeters, and once I know that, then I multiply by 30 and then 1.1 and do that. Do the same thing for figuring out how long a time across it is and count the number of breaths, and then take the tidal volume and multiply it by the respiratory rate to get uh, minute ventilation and then look at the slope of the line and how much it dropped uh, to get the VO2. All right, so I'm going to leave those for you to practice. You can see there are answers there that show you how to do it. So you can make sure you're doing it right. And then, like we had before, each box explains what's happening uh, in some detail. And that kind of looks at the numbers at the end and things like that. For the next tracing, right, we have a short time for this lab quiz relative to the other ones. So let's not worry about anything except for the vital capacity here. And the only reason I want to worry about the vital capacity is we did it a little different way in lab, just kind of make sure you know. So in this case, this is a, a vital capacity, and the person was just breathing normally. So you see the tidal volume, okay, which actually measures very similar to the tidal volume that they had when they were just doing that, uh, first tracing. And then they take a maximum breath in, so we see it go up, reach a peak, and then blow it all out, and then go back up to normal. So when I was first explaining this, we used this as an example to count the big boxes, and we said this was 130 millimeters, okay. So if we know this is 130 millimeters, then we can multiply it by the bell correction factor and then multiply it by 1.1, right? So that would be 3,900 times 1.1 would be 4,290. So the minute, sorry, the tidal volume would be 4,290. 
uh, mLs of BTPS. So, and that's, again, the vital capacity. Uh, if you sat here and count this, you know, it's going to be 16. Um, so it's not much different, but it's a little different. So you should be able to, to, to understand vital capacity. But those other things listed here, right? I mean, tidal volume you should be able to do as well. But inspiratory capacity, expiratory reserve volume, functional residual capacity, and total lung capacity, you don't have to do. Just make sure you understand vital capacity from that. So that shows you how to do it again and what each measurement is. And so you can kind of go through that and see it goes all over the place. Um, and then, like we had before, the explanation. And then here is another vital capacity. This vital capacity is called FVC. The F stands for forced vital capacity. And basically, what we do is you tell the subject to blow out their air as hard and as fast as they can. And then you measure how much air they got out there first second. Oh, sorry. First second, second second right here, and third second right here. And depending on your age and, and other variables, you know, a healthy person can typically get out 80, 85% of at least of their air in the first second and if they can't then you start to worry about you know obstructive or other types of restrictive diseases that someone might have uh, affecting that um, again because of the timing factor let's not worry about the fvc um, so don't worry about this one but it, if you're interested it does go through and show you how to measure each one and things like that so that's the respiratory ones and just like you know many of you are feeling right here's one of the more famous classroom far sides right where the kids asking mr osborne can you be excused because his brain is full right i'm sure many of you are probably feeling that right now <laughs>